Hello, and welcome to another Strike Fighters 2 Shorts episode. Today you join me at Utapau Royal Thai Navy Airfield in Southwest Thailand as we get ready to take a flight of B-52s into North Vietnam. The B-52 ranks up there with the F-4 and the Huey as one of the most recognizable aircraft that symbolize the Vietnam War, so today we're finally taking one up. It's early in the morning on December 20th, 1972. We're right in the middle of Operation Linebacker 2, which was a 11-day bombing campaign with emphasis on B-52 strikes instead of smaller tactical aircraft. It saw the largest heavy bomber strikes launched by the U.S. Air Force since the end of World War II. 741 B-52 sorties were flown into North Vietnam, and another 212 went to South Vietnam as arc light flights to support ground operations. North Vietnam launched 266 SA-2 missiles during the campaign. Out of the 196 B-52Ds and Gs that participated, 16 bombers were shot down, and another four were heavily damaged, some crashing later as a result of the damage. Our mission objective today is to strike a strategic target located in the Lang Chi Electric Power Plant, destroy the enemy power plant in the target area. Our call sign will be Python for today. We'll be taking four B-52D Stratofortresses. The D model was the most common variant over Vietnam, and with its upgrades actually held more bombs and had better electronics countermeasures than the later F and G models. Takeoff time this morning is going to be 5.49 a.m. We're looking at about 570 miles to our target, which is going to be on the Red River northwest of Hanoi. It's going to take us about 39 minutes to get there, so we're estimating to be over the target at 6.28 in the morning. Return trip is looking at slightly longer. That's going to be 48 minutes, and we should be landing in the vicinity of 7.16. Let's look at our loadout for today. I'll be flying aircraft number 0049, and I've loaded 84 Mark 83 1,000-pound bombs on board. I'll be dropping a total of 84,000 pounds of ordnance on that power plant today, which means that with my aircraft alone, that's equivalent to four B-29 superfortresses of World War II. With full fuel, I have a takeoff weight this morning of 346,860 pounds. In real life, after the big belly modifications to B-52Ds, they could carry 108 bombs. We don't have the extra 24 bombs today in the game because we don't have the wing racks that the D and F models had in real life. But we still have the enlarged bomb bay, and that will still be more than enough. Looking at Python 2, he's been loaded with 84 M117 750 pound bombs. Python 3 is equipped with 84 AN M47A4 white phosphorus bombs. White phosphorus, sometimes called Willie Pete, is an incendiary bomb that burns extremely hot and is difficult to put out. Finally, Python 4 has the standard loadout of 84 Mark 82 500 pound bombs. Combined, our four plane formation will be dropping 207,510 pounds of bombs today. For comparison, this would be equivalent of 26 B-17 Flying Fortresses over Germany only 20 years earlier. Let's review our map for today's mission. You can see that we're taking off from Utapau, which is right on the coast of southwest Thailand. Utapau is 70 miles southeast of the capital city of Bangkok, which we can see here on the map. We'll take off and begin climbing to 30,000 feet as we head north to our waypoint, which is just a little south of Udorn Air Base. And we can see that at this time in the war, Udorn is overflowing with a ton of F-4 squadrons. After that, we'll continue north and cross over the mountains of Laos to our initial point over North Vietnam. We should be there about 35 minutes into the flight. We'll make the slight right to line up with the target and begin our preparations to drop bombs. Our target is a power plant right on the banks of the Red River, and we should be over it at 40 minutes. Now the difficult part comes as we have to make a lumbering right turn to reverse our course, and it's likely that this will bring us right over the Hanoi region. We'll be in danger of SAMs and fighters at this point, but luckily we'll be faster without our bombs, so hopefully we can scoot out of the area before anything bad happens. We'll proceed back over Laos and into Thailand for Waypoint 7, which is right near Uban Air Base, and after that we'll begin our descent and follow the last of the waypoints into land on runway 18 at Utapau. 
And finally, let's look at our roster for today's mission. I'll be flying in Python 1 as Captain Billy Crenshaw. Once again, he's been our pilot through all of the shorts so far, so that continues today. Python 2 is going to be Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Raspberry. <laughs> Python 3 will be Major Jeff Suzanne. And Python 4 will be Major Gordon Dennis. Well, I don't know about you, but I already feel much better knowing that Raspberry and Suzanne will be on my wing. All right, that concludes today's briefing. We've covered everything that we need to. Let's head on out to the flight line and climb aboard our B-52s for a very long flight today. It'll be about an hour and a half flight, over a thousand miles in and out of Hanoi in North Vietnam. Let's get underway. All right, here we are out on the runway at Utapau. It's 10 of 6 in the morning, and we have a heavy overcast, so very dark. All of our nav lights and landing lights are on as we are in position, and I've gotten clearance from the tower for takeoff. As I get the radar set up and ready to go, and we look around this cockpit, we can see that we are still in the, the original analog cockpit of the B-52. This is long before any of the uh, electronic modernization that we see in modern B-52Hs. This is all long, long before that. The only screen that we have is the RWR down there and our radar screen. Everything else is old school gauges. All right, I'm ready to go. Let's push the throttles forward on our eight engines. And the water injection pops on for added thrust. This is over 42,000 pounds of thrust from our J57 engines pushing us down the runway. Seventy-five knots. There's a hundred. We're more than halfway down the runway now as we're just reaching 150 knots and I'm going to start to rotate. And lift off. Positive rate up. Gear up. Alright, so since we're taking off to the south, we're looking at that water there. That's the ocean, that's the Gulf of Thailand. And we'll start to make our turn to come around. Just off to the left of our nose there, we see the city of Rayong, which we will pass right by. And I'm setting a thousand feet per minute climb to begin our very, very long climb up to 30,000 feet. And here goes the rest of the squadron making their departures as well. There we go, waypoint reached. We're actually out over the Gulf of Thailand right now. There's Rayong. And these B-52s fly humongous circles in the sky. We do not have uh, small turning radiuses, so we'll just make our gradual turn back to course here. And we circle around that city completely. Suzanne is up, or maybe Susan, Susan with an E, I'm Mr. Susan and it's time for you to do the choosing. Look at them shine. And there goes number four. Alright, it's going to take a while for all four of our aircraft to rejoin on my wing now. Um, if I had less of a time constraint, 
I would do some circling maneuvers so that they could all slowly uh, form up. But if I take too much time, then the way that the missions are set up here in Strike Fighters, I'll be way behind any of my escorts and way behind any other flights that are assigned to suppress anti-air defenses. So we would be going in well behind the rest of the strike force and have no protection. So hopefully uh, I'm, uh, I'll throttle back a little bit once we get up to altitude and then hopefully the rest of the, the squadron will, will get on my wings pretty, pretty quickly. The B-52 Stratofortress is the last in a long line of strategic bombers built by Boeing, and is not only still in use today, but is expected to reach 100 years of service before its planned retirement in the 2050s. The aircraft is known informally as the Buff, standing for Big Ugly Fat Fucker. The B-52 is 159 feet long, with a wingspan of 185 feet wide. It has a 50,000 foot ceiling and can fly in excess of 10,000 miles without refueling. It had a crew of six, which would later be reduced to five when the tail gun was removed in 1991. The plane can hold up to 70,000 pounds of ordnance, compared to the 20,000 pounds of the B-29, Boeing's previous fortress that saw action in World War II and Korea. Work began on the B-52 in June of 1946, when Boeing won the contract to build a new long-range bomber for the Air Force. The XB-52 began life as a straight-winged, turboprop bomber, but the design would go through massive changes over the next six years. After many changing requirements from the Air Force and design changes from Boeing, the final design was decided over a frantic weekend in a hotel room in Dayton, Ohio. A team of Boeing engineers arrived in town to give a presentation on Thursday, October 21, 1948, to Colonel Pete Warden. Warden, based at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, was the chief of bomber development for the Air Force, and he was disappointed in the aircraft they presented. He asked the design team if they would come back with a proposal for a four-engined turbojet design instead. Returning to their rooms at the Hotel Van Cleve in Dayton, they were joined by Boeing's vice president of engineering, and the team worked overnight redesigning the XB-52. The next morning, on Friday, they returned to Colonel Warden. Warden was encouraged and liked what he saw, but still he asked for a better design. The Boeing team returned to the hotel, and now they were joined by two more Boeing engineers who happened to be in town on other business. By late Friday night, they had laid out what was essentially a new airplane. This design borrowed heavily from the B-47 Stratajet design, using a 35-degree swept wing, eight engines paired in pods under the wings, and two sets of main landing gear in the fuselage, supported by wingtip outriggers. Over the weekend, the team raided local hobby stores to build a scale model, and one of the engineers got to work on the aircraft drawings. A local stenographer was hired to type up a clean version of the proposal. Focusing on weight and performance data, the design was projected to exceed all of the Air Force's design requirements. On Monday, the team presented Colonel Warden with a neatly bound 33-page proposal and a 14-inch scale model of the B-52 as we now know it. The B-52 first flew on April 15, 1952, with famed test pilot Tex Johnson at the controls. Thanks to hours of thorough testing, including 670 days of wind tunnel tests, the flight program went smoothly. A few changes were made over testing, the final being the rearrangement of the flight crew. The two original XB-52s had tandem seating in a bubble canopy, similar to the B-47. The cabin was now rearranged instead to a more conventional side-by-side -side cockpit to increase the efficiency of the crew and reduce fatigue. With this last change in place, the Air Force ordered its first 13 B-52As and production began on the aircraft. At the rollout ceremony in March of 1954, Air Force Chief of Staff, General Twining, made the famous quote that gave the B-52 its first nickname. Quote, the long rifle was the great weapon of its day. Today, this B-52 is the long rifle of the air age. As B-52s were completed, they replaced the now obsolete B-36 one for one. The first B-52 wing became fully operational in March of 1956. 
Early operations were plagued with problems. The aircraft's weight cracked and disintegrated runways and taxiways. The fuel system had problems with leaking and freezing. Bombing and fire control computers were unreliable. The J-57 engines had issues and often failed. In fact, the first fatal crash of a B-52 was due to alternator failure in 1956. The split level of the crew was found to be causing temperature issues. The sun heated the pilot's deck while the rest of the crew sat below on the cold floor. A comfortable temperature for the pilots caused the others to freeze, and if the lower crew had a good temperature, then the pilots overheated. As mission parameters changed, B-52s began flying more low-altitude missions rather than high ones, and this put eight times more stress on the airframe. Within ten years, during the 1960s, several programs were conducted to counter structural fatigue and extend service life. This included a complete reskinning of all aircraft in 1977. Despite the problems, over the years the aircraft would be upgraded and problem areas were addressed, making the B-52 a solid and reliable aircraft. Even with the early problems, the B-52 set many records in the 1950s. Four B-52s flew non-stop around the perimeter of North America, a distance of 15,500 miles. This was done in 31 hours and 30 minutes, refueling mid-air from KC-97 Stratotankers. Strategic Air Command noted that five to six hours could have been shaved off that if the bombers had been able to refuel from jet tankers instead of the propeller-powered KC-97s. Two different B-52Ds set speed records in the same day, one over a 5,000-kilometer closed circuit and the other over a 10,000-kilometer closed circuit. In January of 1957, three B-52Bs made a non-stop flight around the world during Operation Power Flight. Aided by KC-97 air refuelings, the flight covered 24,300 miles in 45 hours and 19 minutes. During Operation Cherokee on Bikini Atoll, a B-52B was the first aircraft to drop a thermonuclear weapon. B-52s flew for Strategic Air Command, also known as SAC. SAC was a branch of the U.S. Air Force and was specifically in charge of two of the three components of nuclear strike forces, those being land-based bombers and intercontinental ballistic missiles. The third component was submarine-launched nuclear missiles, and they were controlled by the U.S. Navy. SAC's previous bomber, the B-36 Peacemaker, had no in-flight refueling, limiting its range. Serious questions had also been raised about the propeller aircraft's ability to outrun its own nuclear blast. Now, with the B-52, SAC had a fast aircraft that could penetrate defenses and could remain airborne indefinitely. To take advantage of this, SAC was able to implement new plans for nuclear deterrence during the Cold War. Under code names like Head Start, Chrome Dome, Round Robin, and Giant Lance, B-52s flew airborne alert patrols with nuclear weapons aboard. Aircraft loitered at high altitude near the borders of the Soviet Union, ready to strike first or retaliate quickly in case of a nuclear war. Incoming aircraft would relieve previous aircraft on station, so coverage was constant. This policy turned out in practice to have major safety drawbacks, and several accidents eventually caused the cancellation of these patrol operations. On March 11, 1958, a B-47 Stratajet from Savannah, Georgia, was flying above the town of Mars Bluff, South Carolina, when its Mark VI nuclear bomb was inadvertently released. Crashing through the closed bomb bay doors, the bomb fell 15,000 feet to the home of Walter Gregg, where its conventional high explosives detonated. Luckily, the nuclear core had been stored elsewhere in the aircraft and was not installed. But the explosion still damaged seven buildings, including a playhouse that Walter Gregg had built for his daughters in the backyard. The bomb hit this playhouse directly, and the explosion left a crater 35 feet deep and 70 feet wide. Gregg, his wife, his son, and his three daughters, who were playing only 200 yards from the point of impact, were all injured. Three years later, on January 24, 1961, a B-52G broke up in midair over Goldsboro, North Carolina, dropping two Mark 39 thermonuclear weapons. The B-52 had suffered a major fuel leak, and while descending, the plane became unstable and lost control. The crew bailed out, though three of the eight crew members were killed. At 2,000 feet, the B-52 disintegrated, scattering debris over two square miles of farmland. The first Mark 39, 
a four megaton weapon, began its arming sequence as it separated, which included popping its parachute. The bomb was found upright, its nose on the ground, leaning against a tree that had caught its parachute. Three of the four arming mechanisms on the bomb had activated, with only the arm safe switch still in the safe position. A single, low-voltage mechanical switch was all that prevented the U.S. Air Force from nuking eastern North Carolina with a bomb 250 times more powerful than Hiroshima. The second bomb plowed into the muddy ground at 700 miles an hour, disintegrating and burying itself over 100 feet into the ground. Luckily, the conventional explosives of the trigger charge didn't fire. Still, the bomb had also partially armed when it left the airplane. When the bomb's arming switch was found in the wreckage, it was in the arm position. If both bombs had finished arming, a total of eight megatons could have detonated. Additional crashes in 1961 and 1963 continued to prove that operational accidents were no longer routine when nuclear weapons had to be recovered or cleaned up. In January of 1966, a B-52G and a KC-135 collided over Spain, killing seven on board the two aircraft. Four nuclear weapons fell from the debris. One landed in the Mediterranean and had to be recovered from 2,800 feet of water after being lost for two and a half months. The other three bombs came down on land near the small fishing town of Palomares. Two of the bombs detonated their non-nuclear explosives and scattered plutonium over almost a full square mile. The U.S. initiated a cleanup process, eventually putting 5.4 acres of soil into 6,000 66-gallon drums and shipping them to the U.S. for disposal. The U.S. also announced that it would no longer fly over Spain with nuclear weapons, followed by Spain formally banning all NATO flights over its territory that carried such weapons. The final straw came on January 21, 1968, almost two years to the day after the Spain crash. A B-52G from Plattsburgh Air Force Base experienced a cabin fire near Thule, Greenland. Declaring an emergency, the B-52 turned towards Thule, but within five minutes, the aircraft's fire extinguishers were depleted, electrical power had been lost, and smoke in the cockpit had obscured the pilot's vision. Waiting until the aircraft was directly over Thule Air Base, the crew ejected. The pilotless B-52 crashed into the ice in North Star Bay, seven miles west of the airbase. The conventional explosives of four nuclear bombs detonated, spreading radioactive material over three miles of snow and ice. The heat of the fires melted the ice sheet, causing wreckage and the weapons to sink to the ocean floor beneath. The cleanup operation lasted nine months and consisted of 550,000 gallons of contaminated liquid being collected and shipped to the U.S. Debris from only three of the four bombs was recovered. Reports in 2008 confirmed that no parts of the fourth bomb were ever accounted for. This marked the end of SAC's airborne alert program, as they halted all flights the day after the crash. The cleanup costs and political consequences had proved too high to risk another accident. Despite its primary duties as a nuclear bomber, in 1964, SAC began training its crews to use the bombers to deliver conventional munitions. B-52Fs were fitted with external wing racks to hold 24 additional 750-pound bombs. The bombers were deployed to Anderson Air Force Base on Guam in 1965 as Operation Rolling Thunder began. Flying into Vietnam from Guam and back again was a 10-12 to hour flight and required air refueling by KC-135s. Also in 1965, B-52Ds received modifications known as Big Belly to hold more bombs internally. With the external payload of 24 bombs and 84 internally, Big Belly B-52s could hold 108 500-pound bombs, or 22,000 pounds more than the F models. In the middle of April of 1967, all F models returned to the United States and were replaced fully by D models at Anderson Air Force Base. B-52s flew arc light missions, carpet bombing base camps, troop concentrations, and supply lines. D, F, and G models all saw combat over Vietnam, though D models were the most used. They were able to carry far more bombs than the other versions, but they also received upgraded Phase 5 ECM systems, which were better than defense system used on the later models. 
Air bases at Guam and Okinawa were finally deemed too far away from Vietnam to meet mission requirements, so a search began for a new, closer base. Negotiations with Thailand allowed B-52s to use Utapau, Royal Thai Navy Base. Fifteen aircraft would be initially allowed, with the provision that U.S. aircraft could not cross Cambodian or Laos airspace to get to Vietnamese targets. By 1972, 54 aircraft were stationed at Utapau, and in 1969, the U.S. began secretly bombing Cambodia at night. The Cambodian campaign became official in 1970, and U.S. aircraft openly bombed North Vietnamese targets using Cambodia for cover. Operation Arclight continued from 1965 till the end of the war in 1973, and B-52s flew 126,615 sorties, with a total of 31 B-52s lost. The B-52 is the largest aircraft with air-to-air -air kills, as two and possibly three B-52 tail gunners were credited with downing MiGs. After the Vietnam War, B-52s went back to their jobs at SAC as nuclear bombers. Instead of airborne alert planes, SAC now had the bombers on 24-hour alert status where they could be scrambled at a moment's notice. Several replacement aircraft projects fell through, such as the XB-70 Valkyrie and the B-57 Hustler. Soviet SAM technology was proving that high-altitude bombing missions were no longer going to be successful, and low-level penetration became the new policy. With no replacement in sight, the B-52 continued on as the Air Force's primary bomber. B-52 Bs, Es, and Fs were all retired throughout the 1960s and 70s, and the Workhorse D models were finally retired in 1982 after extensive overhauls had lengthened their lives. This left only G and H models on nuclear alert duty. Even the introduction of the B-1 only replaced the older models that had been retired and the F-111 aardvark, leaving B-52s the mainstay of the SAC force. With the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, Strategic Air Command was disestablished, and all 365 B-52Gs began to be destroyed in accordance with the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. This left the Turbofan H version as the only variant of B-52 in service today. B-52s were back in harm's way during Operation Desert Storm, striking the first blow against Iraq as seven B-52s flew nonstop from Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana to Iraq, firing 35 AGM-86 standoff missiles. They then returned home to Louisiana with air refueling along the way. This set a record for the longest distance combat mission of 35 hours and 14,000 miles. B-52s continued to fly carpet bombing missions in Iraq, destroying target areas and demoralizing troops, many of whom surrendered following the strikes. 1,620 sorties were flown, dropping 40% of the total munitions fired from coalition forces. B-52s continued strikes throughout the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq during the 2000s, and most recently hit targets in Syria and also were used in show of force flights against North Korea. 78 of the original 744 total B-52s operated by the Air Force are still in service, with plans to extend the aircraft's life out to 2050. And as the air-to-air -air fighting gets pretty heavy over Laos and parts of North Vietnam now. We've just hit our initial point. We're now 32 miles away from our target and I'm going to begin our very slow turn on target. I'm only doing about 30 degrees of bank. Uh, no more than that because if I turn tighter it actually messes up my wingmen because they won't turn tight enough to keep up with me and then they'll be all over the sky. So we'll do a nice gentle 30 degree bank and we're 30 miles out as we come on to target here, I'm going to get us back down to 30,000 feet. I have attempted to install several uh, leading bomb sites in this aircraft with no success. I tried putting the CCIP in from the A6 intruder um, just, just to simulate the, the bombing radar and computer in this aircraft and uh, no luck on any of it. So I have a system in place instead that has proved to be pretty accurate, and I'll, I'll talk you through what I'm going to do right now. 
So first of all, I'm going to use the autopilot to get the plane set up. It's going to be lined right up at the target. It's going to have me at 30,000 feet at between 290 knots and 300 knots. So that's our initial setup that we need. I'm going to turn the heads up display on and that will show me my little target reticule and where it is on the ground. This is simulating my bombing uh, radar and computer. At 10 miles out, I'm going to turn off the autopilot and turn on the wing leveler, which for whatever reason in this plane gives me a 500 foot per minute climb. I'm going to open the bomb bay doors as we get close, and I'm going to look down, and when I match up the reticule over the target box, then it'll be time to drop. At that point, we'll be climbing at 290 knots, we'll be slightly above 30,000 feet, and all these conditions will be close enough that I will most likely hit the target with the long line of bombs that will drop out. So that's what we're going to see coming up here. And here we go, 19 miles out. I'm going to tell my wingmen to attack my target. Good, they've got the target. They've got uh, lots of lots of room now to maneuver and get lined up on their own bombing runs since they won't drop their bombs the same time that I do. They won't drop at all if I don't order them to, so uh, got to make sure that, that they're, they're maneuvering to do their thing. 15 miles away, the HUD is on, simulating our bombing computer. We're on autopilot, which is keeping us at 30,000 feet. We're at 307 knots. Somebody really wants this power plant out of commission today. We've got A7 Corsair 2s flying anti-air suppression missions around the power plant. There's eight Marine A4 Skyhawks working their way up the Red River right now through miles of flak. They're going to be performing a low-level bombing strike on the same target that we are, and the timing has actually been set up so that we will arrive within moments of each other. So if one of us does miss the power plant, the other one's going to clobber it. Tons of air combat still going on nearby, which is good. That's keeping the fighters off our backs. And coming up on the moment of truth. There we go. I'm engaging the wing leveler. We're 10 miles out. Bombay doors are coming open. You can see there's our 500 foot per minute climb. As we're less than 10 miles speed's coming down but should stay above 290 and here come the marines within visual sight of that power plant and bombs away on the marines looks like thousand pound bombs and i can see a corsair 2 down there oh some hits within the facility All right, our turn now. Looking straight down as far as we can. We're eight miles out from the target. 30,300 feet, 290 knots, bombs away. That's 84,000 pounds of bombs falling out of the sky. In addition to the wingmen, there's bombs falling out of the wingmen. And we're gonna begin our gentle turn to the right as I deselect the weapons and turn the HUD back off.
And we got a call for Mission Accomplished from Red Crown as we're circling back around, heading back towards the Red River and uh, the capital region just in front of us and slightly off of our nose left there. You can see on the RWR we've got tons of ground radars uh, pinging the skies out there looking for us and all of the other uh, aircraft. Lots of SAMs coming up at our friendlies. Luckily none at us so far. We're losing a bunch of friendlies down there to Sam's. We have 29,000 pounds of fuel left, so no problem there. 30,000 feet, 300 knots. Trying to head our way back out of North Vietnam now. 122 miles to our next waypoint, though. And we're not out of the woods yet. We're still deep in enemy territory. More Sam's. try to get the rest of my guys back on me. Python 3 is on my wing, but looks like 2 and 4 are still scattered out behind me. Uh-oh. RWR is showing two, no, three tracking radars directly ahead of me on the ground. Oh, and the news just keeps on getting worse. We're being tracked by Black Sams, which was a mysterious type of Sam that suddenly appeared during the summer of 72, only to disappear a few months later. These new Black Sams were stouter than the familiar SA-2 guideline and were an ominous dark black in color. They also appeared to be resistant to standard ECM jamming, as well as being far more maneuverable than the standard SA-2s. Either way, we might be in some trouble here because my ECM is on and it looks like they're tracking us through it. Oh shit, here comes one now. Oh, it's right on target for me. Chaff, 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 chaff. Oh, Jesus, that was close. Woo! Let's just make sure there's no more coming up from down there. That was really close. That thing almost got me. All right, just crossing back over the Red River now. Lots of air combat still going on down low. The B-52A was the original production model. Thirteen were ordered, but only three were made in 1954, and these all stayed at Boeing for use in their test program. The other ten were upgraded at the factory into B models. The A model incorporated the first underwing fuel tanks, and side-by-side -side cockpit seating. A models were equipped with Pratt & Whitney 
J57 P1W engines with 10,000 pounds of thrust. A 360 gallon water tank allowed for water injection to raise thrust to 11,000 pounds for a short time, such as takeoff. The B-52B was the first version to enter service with the Air Force. 50 aircraft were built between 1955 and 57. The B version included minor upgrades to engines and avionics, adding an extra 12,000 pounds of thrust due to water injection. Crew complement was six. The two pilots and the electronics countermeasures crew member ejected upward, while the lower deck crew ejected downward. The tail gunner had to jettison the gun turret to escape. The C model increased the range and weight of the plane by adding larger wingtip tanks. A new fire control computer was introduced. 35 of these aircraft were built during 1956 and 57. The bottoms of the aircraft were painted anti-flash white, intended to reflect the thermal radiation of a nuclear detonation. The B-52D was a dedicated long-range bomber with no reconnaissance options. They would also become the most used version in Vietnam. With big belly modifications, they could carry more bombs than other versions for carpet bombing, and the installation of the Phase 5 ECM meant that they were better protected as well. 170 aircraft were built between 1956 and 58. D models assigned to Vietnam were painted in SEA camo with black bottoms to avoid being spotted by searchlights. The B-52E had an updated avionics system and bombing navigational system. All 100 aircraft were built in 1958. The B-52F had improved J-57 engines with a larger water injection thrust. The F had serious problems with fuel leaks that were only solved after three upgrade modifications. 89 aircraft were built between 1958 and 59. The G model was a major departure from all previous models. A new wet wing was introduced, which included fuel tanks in the wings in addition to the external wingtip tanks, which increased weight by 38,000 pounds along with increased range. The ailerons were deleted completely, with roll being achieved using spoilers. The tall tail was cut down by eight feet and the nose radome was larger. The crew was rearranged into what was called the battle station concept. The tail gunner was physically moved out of the tail and into the main cabin, and his position in the tail was replaced with radars for remote firing. Pilots and two bombing navigation system operators faced forward, while the ECM operator and the tail gunner faced aft. The water injection system for the engines was increased to 1,200 gallons. The increased weight from fuel capacity caused 60% more stress on the wings than older models, which caused several crashes before modifications were made during 1964. 193 aircraft were produced from 1959 to 1961. Most of these were destroyed between 1992 and 2013 in accordance with the START Treaty with Russia, with only a few museum models remaining. The B-52H is the only variant left flying today. Retaining all of the upgrades of the G model, the H made a switch to TF-33 turbofan engines. This gave the plane better performance and fuel economy than the J-57 turbojets. The H model switched out the four 50 caliber machine guns in the tail to a single 20 millimeter Vulcan cannon. The version also received an ECM and avionics update. 102 H models were built between 1961 and 1963. During the Gulf War in 1991, the tail guns and radars were removed completely. This was due to an incident where a friendly harm missile locked onto the tail gun radar of a B-52 over Iraq and hit it, doing it severe damage. In total, 744 B-52s were built. The entire production run was only over the years of 1954 to 1963. No B-52 flying today was built after October of 1963, which was when the last H model rolled off the line. It is one of the oldest military aircraft to be in constant service, on par with the Tu-95 Bear and MiG-17. Utapau is an airfield built by the Royal Thai Navy in 1961 meaning Cradle of the Trade Winds, 
Utapau village had once been a thriving shipyard for building merchant sailing ships. In 1954, Thailand had signed the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, or CETO, to become an active ally of the United States and to oppose communist influence in the region. During the French War with Vietnam, Thailand disliked both sides and had remained neutral. But the 1959 civil war in Laos worried Thailand that a communist revolution would spill over into their own country. So, in 1961, they signed a treaty with the U.S., that allowed them to use Thai airfields to launch recon aircraft and troops into Laos and later North Vietnam. When Operation Arc Light began in 1965, B-52s were flown from Anderson Air Force Base on Guam and Kadena Air Base on Okinawa, and the Air Force immediately began looking for a base that didn't require air refueling and was closer to the combat zone. An airfield in South Vietnam would have been the perfect solution, but security was such a problem there that the U.S. looked to Thailand instead. At the time, KC-135 tanker aircraft were stationed at Don Muyang Air Base near Bangkok, and having foreign aircraft in the capital was a bit of a political embarrassment to the military government of Thailand. So, that same year of 1965, the two countries reached a mutually beneficial agreement to loan the use of Utapau Air Base to the U.S. and to allow them to upgrade it to handle their heavy bombers and tankers. The expansion of Utapau began in October of 1965, and eight months later, the new 11,500-foot runway opened. The KC-135s were moved there, getting them away from Bangkok, and B-52s began arriving in April of 1967. One of the stipulations that Thailand had demanded was that, in return for allowing the U.S. bombers to base at Utapau, no combat missions into Vietnam from Thai airspace would be allowed to cross over Cambodia or Laos. While fully supporting the U.S., Thailand still didn't want to incite her neighbors who, while actively supporting North Vietnam, were officially neutral. Obviously, today in the game, we've cruised right over Laos without a thought, but flying around and into South Vietnam would have put us far behind schedule. Also, I'm not sure how strictly this no-fly policy was enforced, especially after 1969 when Nixon approved secret B-52 raids into both Cambodia and Laos. When the operations in Cambodia became open in 1970, it seems likely that the restrictions were probably lifted or at least ignored. Utapau was at first only a frontline base, with admin and mission scheduling remaining with the 8th Air Force at Anderson Air Force Base. Small numbers of B-52Ds would detach from each of SAC's stateside units and rotate in for a 90-day deployment at Utapau. This changed in January of 1970, when the 307th Strategic Wing became permanently based at Utapau, becoming the only regular SAC wing stationed in Southeast Asia. Under the command of the 8th Air Force, headquartered on Guam, the 307th included three bombing squadrons and a refueling squadron. In addition, a detachment of search and rescue HH-43 helicopters operated from the base. C-130s of the Air Force's Tactical Airlift Command moved their operations from Bangkok to Utapau later in 1970. The Paris Peace Accords were signed on January 27, 1973, ending the U.S. involvement in Vietnam. However, Operation Arclight missions continued as B-52s flew strike missions into Laos and Cambodia for another seven months. The 307th Strategic Wing finally ended all operations on August 14, 1973. Airlift Command C-130s continued to fly out of Utapau on supply missions into Cambodia and South Vietnam until 1974, when these missions were taken over by a private contractor. During the North's invasion of South Vietnam in 1975, Utapau supported Operation Frequent Wind and the refugee evacuation of the country. Parking ramps and grass areas of the base were filled to capacity with Republic of Vietnam Air Force, helicopters, aircraft, and tents of Vietnamese people. 123 C-47s, C-119s, and C-130s filled to capacity with men, women, and children arrived at Utapau. On the 30th of April, South Vietnam surrendered, and the handful of RVNAF aircraft that had been performing last-ditch attacks flew to Utapau, leaving their homes behind. The U.S. Air Force packed up and left Utapau at the end of 1975, 
and control of the base was officially returned to Thailand in June of 1976. Today, the base is home to the Royal Thai Navy's first air wing, which includes four fixed-wing squadrons and three helicopter squadrons. The airport is also known as Utapau International Airport and is so busy that upgrades are underway to increase capacity to 3 million passengers per year. Utapau is close enough to the capital that it is being branded by the government as another option for flying into Bangkok. Landing and navigation lights are on. I've turned the ECM off. Just crossing 5,000 feet, we're five miles out from the initial point. Looking to see if I can see Utapau on either the radar or visually. Not yet. Slow enough for landing gear, so gear is out, landing lights on. Utapau coming into visual range now. Just touching 150 knots, which is just enough for one notch of flaps. I only land with half flaps on this airplane because at full flaps, so much lift is generated that the plane climbs uncontrollably and it's almost impossible to set it down. Um, it's just a very dangerous condition. And I actually read that in real life the same thing happens, it's just that on the real airplane you can trim it. You trim the, uh, the horizontal stabilizers. Um, to keep it in line. Well, I don't have that ability here, so instead I just use the half flaps. And it doesn't particularly affect landing speed. I'm not stalling out of the sky or landing particularly fast. You can see that we're at 125 knots on approach right now, which is which is actually pretty slow. So um, half flaps does the job just dandy for me. We're two miles out from touchdown now. 1,400 feet, 125 knots. I'm deploying the air brakes so that it pitches the nose up just a little bit and I can put some power on the engines to control my descent better. Just starting to get the beginning of a stall buffet and warning from the horn. Not in danger of falling out of the sky just yet, though. Things are looking good. We're coming right down just a little left of center line. There's the stall horn. Just as we touch down. Flaps up on the rollout. Then we're slow enough to take this first turn out. Clear the runway for the rest of the aircraft behind me. And as we turn off the runway, we complete a very successful strategic strike mission in our B-52 Stratofortress. We saw our bombs strike across the Red River and walk right into the middle of the power plant, taking it out probably permanently. The bombs then went right on across the plane and our wingmen's bombs did additional damage to the facility. We were able to avoid fighter entanglements, but we did have a SAM scare from an SA-2X 
but luckily Chaff confused it at the last second, though it was so close we could feel its shockwave as it passed by. For having to fly over a thousand miles today to the target and back, our timing was spot on. We were supposed to arrive over the target 39 minutes in at 628, which is exactly when we released our bombs, 628. This perfect timing meant that our bombs landed on the target just moments after those of the A-4 squadron, meaning that today's strike was truly a coordinated, multi-service strike. Our return leg was supposed to be 48 minutes long, to touch down at 7.16 in the morning, and our actual touchdown time was just after 7.20, so only a few minutes later than estimated, which meant that our estimated flight time of an hour and a half, we were only a couple minutes over that, so pretty good. We've returned to Utapau with no losses, no damage, and I was able to successfully demonstrate my level bombing technique, which tries to overcome the shortcomings of the game's avionics. Thank you so much for joining me here today, as I finally got to show off uh, this very interesting and popular B-52. Join me again in the future as I fly more shorts missions and continue my campaigns flying and fighting across the skies of Vietnam. <laughs>